We welcome you this evening with full bellies. We come together as BIC and COB, as neighbors and family and friends and anyone else who wanders in the open doors. We come together on the edge of Lent to be present. So along with turning off your mental distractions, we invite you to make sure that any electronic devices are also um, quieted. Thank you. Hear these elemental words from Genesis. When the Lord God formed a human from the dust of the ground and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and the human being became a living being. We come before God as God's creations, as God's people. Out of the dust we were made, with God's breath within us, we came to life. We come to remember that God is as close as our next breath. Our lives get dusty in the daily living, and we will surely return to the dust. We welcome Paula Bowser to share a poem that you, will, you can reflect upon, and you're invited following the poem to sit in silence and reflect on anything that comes. Breath of Life. They say doctors used to hold a newborn by the foot and deliver a slap to bring the first breath. Before we had our little plastic bulbs to suck away phlegm and call, the midwives must have put their mouths to the babe to free the airways, a critical intervention as all waited breathlessly for the borning cry. We were all that helpless, lumps of lifeless clay, if Genesis is to be believed, when the divine midwife knelt in the mud to put her mouth on ours, that the breath of life might flow from her body into ours. There is to be sure the mighty rushing wind crashing through the upper room and the torrential tempest from the four corners of the earth that raise the dry bones from the desert floor to forge an army. Yes, breath may be manifest as gale force gusts, it's true. But remember this too. After Jesus breathed his last, there came what some have called the soft Pentecost, wherein the Lord spoke peace to his disciples and sent them into the world to deal with sin. But he did not send them in till he breathed on them. Breathed on them. How profound and profane. How intimate and insane. And I mean, just how? I mean, was it in a small circle or one by one? When I try to picture these mysteries, I'm stymied. However it happened, we know this. Our Redeemer's breath is divine spirit, that same essence which Hildegard of Bingen called veriditas, that sacred sap which enlivens and nourishes every green thing. Oh, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. And it permeates the heavens, too, which are filled with God's glory. The force infused in every atom, and Adam, and Eve, and us all. We require that gift because the breath of life feeds every vibrating cell and allows for healing 
and feeling and growth and grace. We tend to ignore the quiet fall and rise, the thrumming pulse, the singing sighs. Unless we pay attention, we don't know that it's even happening, but it is in you, in me, relentlessly. Breath is imperceptible except to those who listen and cherish. If we do not attend to it, oh, here comes the preacher, we'll soon be like Samson sleeping in Delilah's lap. He did not know that the breath of God had departed from him. The mystics say that the very name of the Holy One is a stand-in for breath, a word that even sounds like we sound when we inhale and exhale. And if that's so, we cannot in fact breathe without worshiping, without celebrating the presence of our living God. Now, it's not on ivory cardstock, in sable calligraphy, but each day we are invited to attend to the breath of life, to shut off all actions and distractions and be present to our own bodies. What stops the breath? An enemy's approach? A friend's reproach? Oh, we tend to those, don't we? Is it in that moment when we watch as a child is pulled from the rubble or see the sweat and blood of sacrificial love? Is it when we smell a rose or see a snake or feel fire or drink in the song of a silken choir? Like the Queen of Sheba, before the wisdom that was embodied in Solomon, we might ask each night, what terrible or beautiful thing made me breathless today? Was it a radiant face or a prophetic word, a loving caress or a sunset? Was it a story ringing with truth? And what quickens our breath, fear, the thought of death? What makes it return and burn in us again, friend? And why will we be panting when playing hide and seek, when the hunter comes clamoring close at hand? We can hardly stifle the sound as we gulp the air pulse pounding. Do we not in fact want to be found? Oh, and how blessed are we to be able to breathe and in the ebb and flow to know that we have already been found and surrounded and to be at peace.
I invite you to put a hand on your belly and begin to feel the rising and falling. As you breathe in, be reminded that this is God's breath for you. As you breathe out, release all that you hold and that is holding you. Let go of what was so that the God of now may fill you again. In is the blessed assurance for our lives. Out is our confession. We speak to the one who has known us before we were even born. This cycle of in and out will be our assurance and confession that we share together. Let us breathe together. Breathe God's breath into your nostrils. We breathe the God of God in our lungs. Breathe in your birth as God's dusty creature. We breathe out our fear of being messy. Breathe in the strength to see with clear eyes. We breathe out the closing of the heart. Breathe in the truth of God's promises. We breathe out the brokenness of our unkept promises. Breathe in joy in being God's child. We breathe out grief over not being enough. Breathe in a life fully lived. We breathe out the smallness of our daring. Breathe in the knowledge of God's whiteness. We breathe out our self-imposed limits. Breathe in the ability to turn again toward God. We breathe out the stubbornness of self. Breathe in God's constant care. We breathe out our shame of not getting it right. Breathe in God's presence in community. We breathe out self-inflicted isolation. Breathe in the truth of inevitable loss. We breathe out the fear of letting go. Breathe in our memory of God in us. We breathe out the pain of private losses. Breathe in the death of false self. We breathe out the clinging to false self. Breathe in each step on the journey. We breathe out our addictions to gratification. 
Breathe in the wonder of the journey. We breathe out our complacency of habit. Breathe in the journey to wholeness. We breathe out our frozen beliefs and ideas. Breathe in God's boundless grace. We breathe out our limited hope. Breathe in the blessings of confession. We breathe out what God, God's pardon. Breathe in God's assurance of that pardon. We breathe out all doubt and falsehoods. Breathe in God's vision for us. We breathe out our shame of being seen. Breathe in God's commission with us. We breathe out our sins of omission with each other. Breathe in love's daily endurance. We breathe out our love of sinning. Breathe in God's peace for the nations. We breathe out love of defense and aggression. Breathe in God's promises for the church. We breathe out past. Breathe in the invitation to repent. We breathe out our fear to face our sin. Breathe in the gift of sackcloth and ashes. We breathe out our running from being touched. Breathe in God. We breathe out fear.
Brothers and sisters, we're about to do a thing that might strike some of us as strange. I know that probably here tonight, there's at least a person or two that maybe hasn't done this. We're going to take Ash and myself or our sister Tracy, when you come up, if you elect to come up, we'll put that ash on your forehead in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll make a cross on your forehead with it. And we'll speak a, a reminder of his peace, of his death for you, of your dustiness. We'll speak some words that remind you of these themes. And I want to give you a brief explanation for that, especially for those of you who maybe haven't done this before. We are dust, as we have been reminded in this service, that is animated by God's breath. But we remain dust. And if he tarries, to dust we shall return. We cannot escape that fate. And human life is better and it is sweeter when we remember that we are not God, that we are limited, that we are finite, that we are frail, that we need our maker, his breath in us, and we need each other. For if we fight our decline, if we take the bad advice of that old poet who said, rage, rage against the dying of the light, well, that's impotent rage. There is no grace to be found in denying that you are dust. God's people from time immemorial in the Old Testament and beyond, because they were dust, when they had suffered great loss, would place dust upon their heads, and they would wail and they would mourn. And that dust was a symbol that, Lord, this is all I am, and this is what my life has become, and I am sad, and I am sorry, and I need you. For that dust on their heads when they grieved was a reminder of their need. And it was an expression of hope, for there was one to whom they could go in their need. And when they had sinned, when David had sinned so grievously against the Lord, they would place dust on their head. It was a sign of grief and a sign of repentance. And they would place that dust upon their brows and they would say, Lord, I have screwed up. I'm dust. I'm nothing. Lord, can you make something again out of this dust? Can you breathe again into me and somehow bring life into this death? And the greatest mystery of all, and what I end with is this, that in answer to all that grief, all your grief, and in answer to all that sin and all the repenting of the people of God, God became dust. He took on flesh. He took a body just like yours and mine, a body that could have pain, a body that got tired, a body that wept, a body that, 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 that bled before he even got on that cross in Gethsemane because of the worry that nodded his stomach because he felt what we felt and he lived as we lived and he took on our dusty existence to raise us out of the dust. That every particle of the dust in your body would be animated forever eternally by that breath of God that you would participate as the dust that you are in the divine life. That's the gift of Jesus Christ. And so we place dust on you as a reminder of, of our finitude and our failure. But we place the dust in the shape of the cross to remind you that your finitude is met by the infinite God and everything you lack is supplied by him. And to remind you that all your failures are swallowed up in an infinite sea of grace, that Jesus Christ has lived and died and risen again to forgive us and to give us a new life. And so, brothers and sisters, I'm going to invite you to pray with me now. And then as you are ready, if you want to come, you just come down this aisle and, and Tracy and I will be up here and we will do that for you. We will place that reminder of your finitude and failure and of his infinite grace upon your brow. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our friend who came and sought us when we dusty things were hurting and broken. Lord, we confess to you that we often make a mess of our lives. We're so weak, Lord, and our weakness leads us into sin. 
But you said if we confess our sins, that you are faithful to forgive them, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we do. We confess that we're little, that we're finite, that we've failed, that we've fallen, that we've sinned and screwed up, and we rejoice in the fact that you have met us in this dust. You breathe upon us. You set us free. Not from all our limits, but within our limits. You instill your divine presence and grace. We love you, Lord, and pray for the grace to love you with all our dusty hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the breath within us, we pray these things to you, our Abba Father. Amen. Come when you are ready. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
To be known in our messiness and loved in God's fullness is the continuing story of our faith. Just as individuals have daily and yearly stories of redemption, so do congregations and districts. An important part of our walk of faith is listening to one another's stories so that we can know more about how God moves upon this earth, so that we can be inspired to look for and know the ways God could be moving in our lives and our congregations. We have asked for congregations to share how God first breathed life into them at the start, as well as a challenging crossroads in their journey together and how God's abiding love was present through that critical time. We begin uh, this evening with our host congregation. Hi again, brothers and sisters. Um, our church that you're now in, uh, the East Dayton Fellowship, is going through a great transformation. Uh, we have merged the East Dayton Church of the Brethren and the East Dayton Fellowship. And there are many stories along the way that I could share of um, things falling apart and failing and looking irredeemable before God took them and turned them around. I'll share a couple very briefly. I remember the church plant that I started that eventually merged with the Church of the Brethren Church was doing really well for a while. We had a lot of youth coming. It was mostly youth. Kids, uh, some of them pretty young. We had like a couple kids in diapers on up through teenagers. And at that time, we met mostly in my house. We were just beginning to use the premises here a little bit. And uh, there were uh, black kids, white kids, some Hispanic kids, um, some Turkish Muslim kids would show up. Eventually, their dads found out that they were coming to a Christian thing and, and <laughs> kind of put the kibosh on that. Um, but uh, that was going really well. We were running out of space practically in the house 
when two sets of boys started to argue with one another increasingly. So two young white boys and two young black boys. And I remember the day when I was visiting the two black boys, uh, Marcus and Quentin, on their block. And the white boys came on to their block. That block was, is mostly African-American. And they came and they were riding their bikes up and down the, the street just to be a nuisance. Like they like came to stir something up. And I literally was happened to be standing in the yard to witness this whole thing. And those white boys ran by those black boys on their bikes and said, not real loud, but loud enough that we could hear it, the N-word, as they rode by on their bikes. And Marcus and Quentin looked at each other in fury and hurt in their eyes. And then these other two boys turned their bikes around and rode back the same way again. Once again, they utter that word as they ride by. They turn their bike around again. I'm yelling, go home, <laughs> go home. They come and they say it a third time. Marcus and Quentin snap. They jump uh, on top of those boys, tack them off their bikes, and there's a brawl in the middle of the street. The one young white boy had his nose broke. Immediately, blood's going everywhere. I'm screaming and hollering. It's one of those situations you don't know which way is up. You're just trying to get them apart. Eventually, they end up apart on either curb. Literally, the two uh, white kids were sitting on this curb, one real bloodied. The two black boys were over on the other curb. The whole block's out. They're furious. They're angry. I could tell you a cool thing about this real quick. The older brother, the one black boy, came and brought a rag to help clean up the face of the bloodied young white boy. That was a cool thing, a cool moment of grace. But you know what happened after that? I can't tell you some big story of how they all made up and it was all okay. The youth group imploded. It was gone. Over, practically overnight, like there were like three kids that showed up at the next one because all the friends of the white boys were like, we're not coming if they're coming. And all the friends of the black boys said, we're not coming if they're coming. And I did everything I knew to do to try to create some kind of reconciliation to, to pull something back together. And it just was gone. And I remember there were a couple evenings when um, uh, we'd, we'd uh, have a thing at the house. And I remember there's a young, uh, young lady, there's an older lady in our midst named Dolores. Uh, I don't think she's here tonight. She's in her 90s. She'd be the only one that showed up with me. We went from having 25, 30 more people than nobody. And I felt so defeated and so lost and so inadequate. What am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. I won't tell you the whole long story because I would be up here a long, long time. But I ended up in the office of a mentor crying and basically saying, I give up. I'm not going to keep doing this. I'm done. I tried. It failed. And I just can't. I don't have the strength to keep going on with this. And that mentor basically said, God's not done. <laughs> you failed. That failed. You're not done. And so go and meet with Dolores. If that's what it is, if it's you and Dolores having Bible study together in your living room, that's what it is right now. Go do that. Brothers and sisters, every week in our church right now, there are hundreds of people that are being fed and clothed in the name of Jesus. I don't really know how we got from there to here. It wasn't because I planned anything. It wasn't because I'm smart or any of the people. Well, all the people in my church are smart except me. But um, I, I, it's grace. I, I got to tell you one, one last thing. I could repeat that story of it all falling apart at least two full other times where I just thought everything fell apart. It's done. The church is done. The work is done. We're all done. And in every single case, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't enough. The church wasn't enough. The leadership wasn't enough. And it was, it was God bringing a thing to us from outside. God, like God working that did it. Not a plan we worked, not, a, not an initiative, not anything else, but God coming to us in, the, in a wasteland moment and breathing into what was just ash and putting flesh on bones and making, like Ezekiel saw, an army where there had been only bones. God does that, brothers and sisters. God breathes into our ash.
Hi, I'm Connie Schiffedecker. I was from the former Price's Creek Church of the Brethren. So what I have is a little different story. It's about our history and where we've went. It started in 1834 when there were 12 pioneer brethren following God's call to form a church. When they first formed the church in 1834, they were meeting in people's homes like they did back then, and they were also meeting in recently built barns. <clears throat> Present day building that we're in right now or have been in was built in 1864. When it was first built, I don't know how many of you have been to Price's Creek, uh, but the, build, the door to the building is on the south side of the building. When it was built, it had it had three doors on the west side of the building. The south door was for the men, and they sat on the south side of the congregation. The middle door was the women's door, and they sat on the north side. And uh, the third door was where the sexton lived. He actually had rooms and lived there to take care of the church building. Um, as you can tell by the sound of that, that was a lot of old order um influence there. So we were pretty much, even though it was Church of the Brethren, there was a big uh, old order uh, presence. Um, after that, we were meeting about four or five years or the, the church itself, there was a split then and the old order split off because uh, Price's Creek Church of the Brethren wanted to start Sunday school and old order don't believe they think the teaching should be done by the parents in the home. So the split was actually over Sunday school and then Pr at Price's Creek German Baptist is on 726. So about a mile from us, they built theirs and they were both known as Price's Creek. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, when you go in the south or uh, west side of the building, across the road is where they parked the horse and buggies when they first started, because back then they weren't driving cars. And so they we had a whole rack over there where they parked the horse and buggies. Um, in 1990, uh, that's when they built and changed the opening to the south side of the building and the two doors the where the men and women went in were closed up and the door that is on the uh, west side now actually goes into what was our uh, women's fellowship or we call it the aid room where they uh, women worked every Wednesday on quilts and whatever. In 1834, we started with 20 members that started the church. In 1880, we were up to 128 before the split. When the old order split off, then we went down to 75. So it split just about in half, a little less. In 1921, we had 280 members, but we were in three different houses. We had, at that point, we had Cedar Grove, Castine, and Price's Creek, but they were under one umbrella. They had joint council meetings. They kept the attendant, you know, records. Uh, but in 1925, uh, 165 was our number after Castine split off. In 1930, we were back up to 186. But in 1940, Cedar Grove split off. And they, after that, we, um, well, before the split, we had 225. After the split, we went down to 177. So still a pretty good-sized congregation, but we had really gotten too big, so that's why the splits. In 1944, we were back up to 155, and in 1944, there were 382, but that was counting all three houses. So until then, they were still counting it like one group. They had uh, joint council meetings, and all the decisions were made by the three churches together. But then after they kept splitting off, they have their own. Of course, you know that Castine's no longer Church of the Brethren, but they still have a pretty good-sized congregation when we visited there. Our traditional two-day love feast was always the first weekend in October. It um, originated because of the members living so far apart. They would get together on this weekend when everybody would be there because they didn't, at that point, have services every Sunday like we do now. Um, they uh, started on Saturday, had a lunch Saturday for people because they traveled quite a ways in uh, and they would stay overnight. And that's why they would have a breakfast on Sunday morning, have their service, and then people would head back home. And we actually, up until a couple years ago, 
still had that weekend that we always did communion that weekend. Now, when I was growing up in the church, we also, prior to that communion weekend, had two-week revival services. And when we had the two-week revival services, every night, Monday through Friday, a different church would come and have special music. One week, Monday may be casting, Thursday may be, you know, it was not just Church of the Brethren either. Sometimes we had the local churches that also provided some of the special music. Um, up until very recently, probably within the last two years, we continued to have that weekend two-day communion. Um our, when we had the two-week uh, revival, we always ended with the weekend, and we'd have the foot washing and everything. Um, I think that's one of the things I miss the most. I don't know which churches still have foot washings, but if so, I'd love to be invited. Uh, I miss that, and I think that's a very, if you've ever, never done it, you should do it. If you do it, you'll see how humbling it is and how close you feel to what Jesus did when he washed the disciples' feet. You really get a feeling for, you know, bowing down and washing somebody else's feet. It's very humbling. And that's really all I have, sort of a history, but it's sad to say our last in-person service was September 24th. We had 40 people show up for that, and that for us was good because more Sundays we had anywhere from 6 to 12 um, we had us and another couple that was there like every Sunday. And my daughter drove from Cincinnati every week until the end of August. And then they dropped out too. So it was a sad day and it's been real hard. But uh, some of you probably have seen us. We've tried to visit around to different churches. We will find a church home. We just haven't found it yet, but we're still looking. <laughs> Thank you. How you doing? Uh, Casey Witten Amadon. I attended the Cincinnati Church of the Brethren for a couple of years, and I've been up here in Dayton and uh, pretty sporadically attended, uh, let's see, Beaver Creek, Tip City a couple of times, and I'm attending Lower Miami. And uh, my mom still attends Cincinnati Church of the Brethren, and uh, she's apparently still giving me uh, errands. And uh, so I'm happy. But no, in all honesty, the Cincinnati Church of the Brethren is a great church. Uh, very dynamic, and I'm very happy to uh, read a statement from them. So the current Cincinnati Church of the Brethren was inspired by the 1996 annual conference in Cincinnati and led by Gerald and Sandra Harley. Previously, there was a Church of the Brethren in the Northside neighborhood of the city from 1912 to 1963. The current fellowship began as a house church, then began renting space in schools and churches in the northern suburbs for the decade. A three-year district grant helped the congregation hire Eric Anspaugh as full-time pastor from 1998 to 2001. And following Eric's departure, the congregation moved to team ministry, led by then-student pastor Ben Walters. Following the 2001 Cincinnati riots and subsequent disinvestment in the city, the congregation uh, felt called to be more active and a living peace church. So in 2007, with a small grant and dozens of volunteers from the district, a building that had been converted from a church to an abortion clinic was purchased and renovated back into the church. Uh, they moved from the northern suburbs into the urban Walnut Hills neighborhood. At the time, two-thirds of the homes and businesses in the neighborhood were vacant or abandoned and crime, uh, litter and drug activity were rampant. However, the neighborhood has a rich history of diversity and activism, going back to the Lane Seminary debates for the abolition of slavery. The, the Harriet Beecher Stowe House remains in the neighborhood and stands as a beacon of hope. In the first decade in Walnut Hills, the congregation was active in a child's ministry, BVS ministry in partnership with local nonprofits, a community garden, and annual Easter egg hunt. The congregation removed the fence between the park and the church and has utilized the park as an extension 
of the church for outreach. Community cookouts, movie nights, Halloween nights, peace programs have been held there, as well as informal basketball, Foursquare, and other fun. In recent years, the neighborhood has gentrified and most low-income families have left. Uh, congregational focus shifted to partnering with First Step Home, which is a recovery center for women with children, and IHN, a shelter for the unhoused. The basement of the church has been converted to a 6,000 square foot warehouse for community needs, from clothes to toys to books to furniture. Uh, we welcome guests to a quarterly free community yard sale and assist families moving out of the IHN shelter or first step treatment programs. We recently served a family of eight who lost everything in a fire to help them get back on their feet, feeding those in need. We keep our people's pantry box, which is an old Cincinnati Enquirer newspaper box, <laughs> outside the church filled with food, toiletries, hats, gloves, and other essentials. The motto is give what you can, take what you need, and the pantry is utilized and supported by many neighbors. Finally, through our neighborhood faith alliance with other churches, our members go on Wednesday to read to kindergarten and first grade children at our neighborhood elementary school. The congregation is small, but we live by faith in God, continues to show us a path forward. When the Constance Church of the Brethren across the river in Kentucky closed in 2020, we welcomed the remaining members into our fellowship and they have been a blessing. We have nurtured five seminary students and more than 20 BVSers in the past two decades. In May, we celebrated as Bethany student pastor Stacy Peterson graduated and was placed in her own congregation in Indiana, but we were left with a leadership void. We prayed about it, and God led two members of the community to step forward to help with the preaching and music duties. Their leadership has opened the door to more people of color becoming part of the congregation, and we are now a racially reconciled congregation. God is good. We are blessed. Hi, Sarah Friedrich, Living Peace. Our church started in 1985 as a reestablishment in the capital city. It's one of the last true church plants of this district where in congregations and individuals pooled their resources to purchase a farm property. It also took district hands to build the sanctuary adjacent to the home. In the 1990s, the church known as New Covenant flourished with up to an 80 members. By 19, right, by 2000, a split became clear because of brethren values and a stance of peace rather than the term of just war. After the split, 10 members remained. These members were faithful. And when I came in 2003 to be a member there, the sanctuary was a little bare as individuals who left the congregation took their objects from the sanctuary that they had donated. Mm -hmm. We rallied and gave money and put things back into the sanctuary as we could. Out of this pain, we decided that maybe New Covenant wasn't our name anymore. There was two other congregations in Columbus named New Covenant, and sometimes we ended up with funeral flower spreads or wedding flowers outside our doors. So in about six weeks after this idea started, we started having morning discussions and prayer of what our name should be. We decided that since we had help found a peace chair 
at Ohio State University. When we were part of the leadership of Central Ohioans for Peace, when we had a founding member of King Nonviolence and an on earth board member, that maybe our, our church was there for peace. And that is how we landed on Living Peace, Church of the Brethren. We are still a small congregation, even today, of 15 members. But we are mighty. And after that name change, things started happening. We decided to not pay to mow three acres of yard and turn it into a prairie. We started finding out about outreaches. We were making meals for women that were getting out of the human trafficking trade. We packed thousands of uh, ba bags for homeless for lunches because there's nothing to eat outside the shelter from breakfast until dinner. We are storing furniture and trying to connect with the immigration uh, resettlements inside Columbus to start giving furniture and things away to them. Out of the ashes, we thrive. We thrive and give, and we give to others, and we are a church of service. Thank you. Will you put, pray with me. God of constant renewal. We thank you for the life and faithful journeys of these congregations. We are grateful for and rejoice in the sharing of their stories. May they inspire all of us. May we each find a blessing in these sacred words. And we pray that each congregation gathered here this evening and around the district feel your presence anew as we step into this Lenten season as part of your body of Christ on this bit of holy, dusty ground. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as we sing together our last song. Look to God, do not be afraid. Lift up your voice, it's the Lord is near. Lift up your voice, it's the Lord is near. My Lord, I'll be ever thankful. Lift up your voice, it's the Lord is Look to God, do not be afraid. Lift up your voice, since the Lord is near. Lift up your voice, since the Lord is near. In the Lord, be thankful. In the Lord, rejoice. Look to God, do not be afraid. Lift up your voice, and it's not a thing to do. It's not your voice, and the Lord is Go with the breath of your Creator who recreates you every day. Go with the promise of the one who walked these dusty roads, who gave his life so that we may receive ours. Go with the company of the Holy Spirit, who whispers, I am as near as your next breath. Go in peace. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. I did. That was good. We did. That's good. You would have brought me up. Oh, no.